Thanks so much for joining us for this uh, noon hour that we have. Um, I'm very delighted to introduce our esteemed uh, panel of editors today to talk about the topic of reporting guidelines for e-health research, um, best practices for online surveys, randomized e-trials, implementation reports, and machine learning studies. My name is Tiffany Leung. I'm the Scientific Editorial Director for JMIR Publications. We have today also on the panel Dr. Khaled El Amam, who is the Canada Research Chair Tier 1 in Medical AI at the University of Ottawa, where he's also a professor in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health. He is also a senior scientist at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute and director of the Multidisciplinary Electronic Health Information Laboratory, conducting research on privacy-enhancing technologies to enable the sharing of health data for secondary purposes, including synthetic data generation and de-identification methods. We also have joining us on the panel today is Dr. Caroline Perrin-Frank. She's the Executive Director of the Geneva Digital Health Hub at the University of Geneva, focusing on data-driven knowledge management in digital health and enabling science-informed policymaking. Previously, as program manager for the RAFT Distance Learning and Telemedicine Network and the Geneva University Hospitals eHealth Service, she focused on the design, development, deployment, and evaluation of innovative health informatics solutions and multi-stakeholder partnerships to strengthen health systems. She also holds a master's degree in IT management and a PhD in global health from the University of Geneva. And finally, our third panelist today is Dr. Gunther Eisenbach. He is a medical doctor, innovator, professor, entrepreneur, founder and CEO of JMIR Publications, aka my boss. <laughs> um, and he is adjunct professor at the School of Health Information uh, Science, University of Victoria. He is also the most cited health informatics researcher in the world, according to uh, an article that's been published previously. And he is the founder of the first PubMed indexed open access journal, the Journal of Medical Internet Research. He also coined the term for infodemiology, which was identified by the WHO as important response pillar to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm very excited to introduce our esteemed editor panelists to you today to be able to talk to you about this very important topic of reporting guidelines for your e-health, informatics, and digital health research that you're doing. So I just have one slide of introduction here for myself, which is to ask the question of why do we care about using reporting guidelines? Um, there is evidence to suggest that for authors, the use of reporting guidelines can be favorable for a variety of different reasons, uh, as listed here. Some of the evidence-based reasons can include, for example, adherence to reporting guidelines um, can also be correlated uh, with citation frequency. Adherence to reporting guidelines by authors when reporting on their scientific work can also result in uh, publication in higher impact factor journals. And finally, that the reviewer ratings of, of manuscripts that adhere to reporting guidelines also may be correlated with more favorable editorial decisions. So when I say reviewer, that's for peer reviewer ratings. Um, naturally, there are many study designs, as you can see on the right side here. Many study designs can apply to your studies that you're doing, of course, uh, around the world. And so we'll cover uh, a few of them today and the relevant reporting guidelines and their statuses uh, with our editors on the panel. So with that, that's the end of my introduction, and I will pass this off to Khaled to get us started here. Great, uh, thank you, thank you, Tiffany. Um, so I will talk about the uh, uh, reporting guidelines for uh, machine learning studies. So these are prognostic and diagnostic uh, machine learning studies. Uh, we've seen many of those studies actually um, presented at this conference. Um, and these uh, reported, reporting guidelines are recommended or strongly recommended for authors uh, submitting articles to Jamie or AI um, uh, today, like that they've essentially be, uh, evolving to become uh, part of the policy of, of uh, this journal. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background and history about why um, this, is, uh, this is important. Um, first of all, Jamie or AI is really um, trying to publish uh, useful articles, articles that we uh, learn something from. 
Uh, we don't um, emphasize uh, novelty as much as other journals. We're emphasizing applied work where we can learn something. So uh, uh, machine learning modeling studies can be very informative. And I'll just give a, a concrete example. And you know, one study we're working on at the Children's Hospital in Ottawa is we, we're trying to build a model to predict uh, 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 returns or, or uh, uh, patients coming back to emerge for asthma, uh, patients or kids with asthma. And so when we look at the literature, we're looking for other modeling studies uh, because we're trying to find out uh, what are the most important features that were used. We're trying to find out the performance of these previous models, um, you know, their accuracy, their AUCs, et cetera, so that we can have uh, empirical benchmarks to compare our work against and to make sure that we, inc we include other features. So all of these studies are actually very useful uh, for, for us when we're trying to build a model for our hospital. So that, that's what I mean by models that are useful that we can learn from and that uh, future analysts can use the results to inform their models and their work in their particular institutions. So we developed these, uh, these guidelines um, and they were really driven uh, out of uh, frustration, so to speak. Uh, we were seeing a lot of papers uh, being submitted where uh, the authors were not reporting a lot of the details about their models. And what that re has results in is uh, many uh, iterations uh, with, the, uh, with the reviewers. Um, so the reviewers, basically the first round will be, you're missing all of these, these details, and it'll go back and another round of revisions for the authors to provide those details. Uh, and then in the second round, the review actually starts when all the details are available. So you essentially waste one round of reviews, which can be a month, two months, depending on the cycle. Um, so in order to accelerate the process, it's much easier for the authors to, uh, to include all the details a priori in their papers to accelerate the review cycles. And sometimes the reviewers can be very critical if you miss some information, so it may actually have, have an impact on the, uh, on the final decision um, uh, as well. Um, and it's also important to note that reporting guidelines emphasize um, reporting of information, it doesn't mean that the information is correct or it's high quality. Uh, so for example, a very simple thing, which is reporting missingness in your data, uh, it's surprising how many authors don't include that type of information in, as part of the descriptive uh, statistics for their papers. And um, you know, if your missingness is, is, is uh, very high and it has an impact on your analysis, that there may be a quality problem or methodology problem. So, so the fact that you report it doesn't mean that there's no problem, it just means that it makes it a lot easier for the reviewers and the editors to make decisions and make decisions quickly so that uh, you don't, authors don't un, end up waiting for a long time. Uh, and also it enables the reviewers to give the authors back uh, some useful uh, and hopefully constructive feedback as well to help improve their work. Um, so, um, up to the point when we developed those guidelines, there were a lot of other guidelines that were already published for reporting machine learning uh, studies. And um, actually there were so many. Um, so we decided that uh, we'll just consolidate existing guidelines. Um, and at the end we did a quality assessment. Uh, so this is different than regular reporting guidelines where there's a pretty well defined process for developing reporting guidelines. Uh, you know, including a systematic review, followed by uh, uh, a, a, a summary of literature, generating items, going through a Delphi process, and, and so on. But given that there were so many existing uh, uh, reporting guidelines, we decided just to consolidate them. So we, we took the uh, data quality assessment, identified the top 17 uh, uh, reporting guidelines, and then consolidated all of them into a, into a, a consolidated set of guidelines. Uh, so this is the argument for, in an area where there's such a large body of work, uh, is it really worth the time and effort and delay in waiting for, uh, to, to produce a new set of guidelines from scratch rather than incorporating all the knowledge and expertise that already exists um, in the guidelines that have already been published. But I would argue for the latter, but of course uh, that, that's something we can discuss. Um, and that allowed us to produce, uh, I think, guidelines that, ha that have pretty good coverage of the issues um, in, in a very short period of time. Uh, and then um, the other important thing is we, we wanted to develop uh, reporting guidelines that uh, are consistent with contemporary practice. 
So uh, there's no point describing or developing reporting guidelines uh, that are ideal. They describe in an ideal world, you'll do all these 30 or 40 things and report them, when in fact 95% of existing studies today only do 20 things. So let's focus on getting the 20 things reported well and done well because that is consistent with current practice and probably consistent with current practice for the next few years uh, rather than having an idealistic set of uh, reporting guidelines where uh, most of the studies will, will, will not meet half the criteria. So we really try to be very, very pragmatic and focused on the, the items that uh, are relevant. And this is important because authors, one of the uh, pieces of feedback is authors, uh, they don't like going through another step to publish a paper, to submit a paper, uh, by uh, uh, checking their work against a set of guidelines and having to complete a checklist and include it in, in their submission. Um, I would argue it's actually very beneficial for authors to do that, but there's always pushback because it's extra effort to, to prepare an article for submission. Um, so, uh, so that's why it's important to keep these uh, checklists and these reporting guidelines um, uh, ensure that they're very focused and pragmatic and they actually provide immediate value to the authors to help them uh, uh, produce better papers that will pass through the process uh, much faster. Um, so general advice to, to authors is always check the guidelines. Uh, reporting guidelines, um, they're actually helpful. Like I have seen the difference. Articles that um, are uh, cross-referenced or have the checklist are much better uh, are reported much more detail uh, than, than those that don't. Um, it's just much uh, more thorough and uh, they're much easier to evaluate and much easier to give authors feedback about the strengths and weaknesses of the work. Um, so from, from an editor's perspective, it's obvious that there is benefit, um, but I think from the author's perspective as well, it, like I said, it accelerates the review cycle. Um, always include the checklist and the supplementary materials. It seems like an obvious thing, but we see a lot of cases where the authors will include, not have a checklist, they'll just say we, we've followed the guidelines, or they include the checklist as part of the supplementary materials that are only for review. So uh, this is very useful for readers as well. Um, and then I think it's important to uh, note that an item in a reporting guideline, even though reporting doesn't mean quality, it should really make you, as an author, think very carefully about uh, how this particular item is implemented, what the implications are uh, to the quality and the general methodology that, that of the study that's, that's being, uh, 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 being reported. I mean, as, as a good example of that is data leakage. So you can describe your validation process for your model, uh, but if your validation process has a serious data leakage problem, then you know, that's, that's bad. That, that's a methodological weakness that probably will result in the paper not passing uh, in its current form. Uh, but hopefully by having a discussion about the validation approach, that will prompt the authors to think about the validation method and whether there are daily leakage, leakage risks in the, uh, uh, in the methodology. Um, so examples, uh, you know, we see often as um, not reporting missingness, um, not reporting hyperparameters, not reporting uh, 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 data, um, the validation that was done to identify potential for, for uh, data leakage, and a you know, classic example of that is ha having multiple observations uh, about the same patients and then, uh, and then splitting the data afterwards. Um, and uh, uh, no reporting of explainability, uh, so no explainability analysis being done in the studies. Um, and then um, not linking the decision-making scenario with the results of the model. So for example, this is, this is a, actually, I think, a good illustrative, illustrative example is uh, if you're building a model that will be used in, a, in clinical practice and uh, your, um, your, your practice can only handle a certain number of positive outcomes a year. So let's say at our hospital, we have an educational program for uh, kids with asthma, and we can only deal with 150 patients a year. So if we, if we predict 500, it doesn't matter. The first 150 are gonna go through, and then we're done because of insufficient resources. So, so then the evaluation should be focused on getting the top 150 correct, right? Uh, I don't care about 160, 170th, 
positive prediction, I want to be able to get the correctly predict 150. So that dictates a certain uh, uh, evaluation outcome than the say you know than accuracy. Accuracy is meaningless in this context. I want to focus on uh, ranking the first 150 uh, 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 patients. So so that's an example of linking your outcome what the outcome you're looking at, how you evaluate your model with the decision-making scenario. So this has to be explained. Um, and then, of course, what we see is inexplicable dropping of patients. So you'd have half a million patients, and suddenly you do a study with 10,000. So what happens? How did you drop all of those? Uh, what were the criteria to make sure there's no bias? So these are the examples of things that we often see. Um, so in terms of next steps and so on, I mean, um, we'd like to evaluate adherence to the guidelines and then see how they helped. Um, Again, our initial focus was to accelerate the cycle, uh, the, the review cycle, so that would be one of the main, uh, 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 was, was, was that applause? Thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, evaluate adherence to the guidelines uh, and their impact on the time it takes to review articles. Uh, we're looking at, uh, we're gonna try to conduct a study soon, uh, evaluating large language models to see if they can complete the checklist automatically based on the articles themselves uh, to accelerate the process and make it easier for, for authors to, to complete these. Um, and then, of course, expansion of this from structured data to other data modalities, so to NLP and um, uh, text, uh, uh, so text and images as well. Uh, but also, I think there's a real need for methodologies for evaluating, for reporting the evaluations of, um, of, of using large language models. We're seeing a lot of submissions, folks using LLMs to evaluate medical exams and so on. And the, the methodologies are uh, all over the map, so I think reporting guidelines for that is probably something that, is, that is, uh, should be a high priority today. Anyway, there's opportunities to help improve the reporting for other types of, of, uh, of uh, machine learning related studies and for other data modalities. Thank you. Good afternoon, so I'm going to speak about uh, digital health uh, implementation reports and the guidelines we developed for that. I'm going to provide a little bit more of background because I think it's a concept that's a little bit different from um, uh, other guidelines. Um, so generally when we look for information on implementations or projects that have been implemented previously, um, we, we face several challenges that make it difficult to really navigate and, and explore the space. And there are two I want to highlight. Uh, one is the fact that uh, what we see on the map here is uh, a scenario in many cases we have pilots that are conducted or projects that are conducted in a pilot um, vertical manner and that struggle to, to scale or to sustain over time. And uh, this map is quite old, but uh, if we take it nowadays, um, I think it still is true in, in many uh, different settings. And this has uh, really been the, the source of the term that we refer to as pilotitis, so the infection of pilot projects. And um, then the second challenge is what I refer to as the digital health paradox, which is really the fact that uh, we have more and more publications that are being, we have more and more data that is being published and we have, while we have more and more of this data, it also makes it more difficult to find what really matters. So um, there's this abundance of data and it's, it's challenging to, to extract uh, the valuable insights that we need to, you know, improve future processes and so on. And now let me draw a little bit from my own experience. I have been implementing digital innovative solutions in different settings, in high income settings, in low and middle income settings. Um, and there are some challenges that are very different, obviously, but then there are also many challenges that are the same. Okay? People don't like to change, whether you're in a hospital in Geneva or you're in a rural clinic in, in Mali. Like, people don't like to change. Uh, it's difficult to uniquely identify patients and so on. And in my experience, uh, if a project works or not, is not only rate related to technology, but a lot of people always put the emphasis on the technology. But in fact, if a project really works or not is... I think 90% uh, uh, related to the surrounding processes. And I, we also believe that you know, the, these challenges persist because we do not learn enough from these processes 
that are surrounding implementations. But why do these challenges persist? So one of the reasons is really that we have a fragmented understanding of, of the full process of the digital health implementation. And then also it's difficult for authors to publish on it because often in journals, as uh, was mentioned before, journals are looking for novelty and uh, you have to add something completely new to the literature. And it's more difficult to, to find a place to, uh, to publish, uh, for example, on, on implementations. And we have this fragmented understanding, which is much like the blind man trying to describe an elephant. So each stakeholder only sees a part of the picture. And I don't know if you're familiar with this parable, but the parable for the parable of the blind man and the elephant, you can imagine a group of blindfolded people that are trying to describe an elephant by touching it. So each of the blindfolded people touches a different part. And obviously, when they are asked to describe it after, their perspective is widely different one from another. And this is what also often happens in digital health stakeholders like developers, clinicians, policy makers. They each have a limited view on, on, on the implementation process. And without a complete picture, um, our understanding remains fragmented, much like uh, those blindfolded individuals. And this is where the I checked guidelines come in um, to really help us remove this metaphorical blindfold and see the full picture to help stakeholders better understand and learn from um, each other's experience in this rapidly evolving landscape um, and, and by really standardizing the reporting on, on standardizing how we report on digital health implementations. So these guidelines were published uh, last year and um, they were developed by a group of global experts, so it was, uh, you know, geographical, um, but also different uh, professional backgrounds, um, and uh, resulted in a 20-item list that really aims to standardize the quality of reporting. Um, the guideline development group defined key considerations. Uh, there was a literature review uh, for the criteria, and then there was a Delphi process, so, so it was a relatively long process with a lot of different stakeholders who consulted it. But then to ensure the practicality and the effectiveness, we also applied it to different examples and it was uh, adjusted based on the feedback we received. Um, and the idea is really that by sharing our experience systematically and standardized, we can create this pool of uh, accessible, actionable information that um, benefits all stakeholders involved in digital health, um, from researchers to practitioners to policy makers and users. And when everyone really uses a standardized approach to report on the implementations and the surrounding processes, we can really build a rich, more comprehensive knowledge base um, that can benefit everyone. And, um, this shared knowledge then can drive innovation, improve future implementation processes, and so on. And to illustrate the power of uh, standardized reporting, I would like just to quickly look at a historical example, example where standardized reporting really had a, a profound impact. Um, so in the 1940s, uh, commercial passenger transportation had just started, but people were scared to use planes because uh, there were many, many incidents, uh, many accidents happening. And the, uh, the aviation authorities and the industry, they had recognized the potential, but they also understood they need to make some changes. So they all met and they agreed on a common uh, set of reporting and which is referred to as the Annex 13. And then they agreed on this Annex uh, incident reporting form and then Afterwards, uh, each uh, organization has used this standardized reporting and it has been shared across the organizations and countries. And the lesson here is very clear, you know. When different stakeholders share a standardized uh, way to report, it can lead to significant improvements uh, across the board. And just as the aviation authorities needed a clear view on the risk and incidents, um, in air travel, to make it safer, we in the, in the digital uh, field need a more comprehensive view of our implementations. 
and that's why we encourage you to share your experience you know from great successes to uh, catastrophic failures and particularly the failures we are really interested in because I think that's the the things where you can actually learn the most from um, so on the left you can see the the QR code to bring you to the guidelines and then uh, also want to mention that uh, in Jamie Medical Informatics there is a specific section that is called implementation reports where you can um, submit implementation reports using the guidelines um, and the idea is really to ensure that valuable insights are not lost but documented and can be harnessed and shared and built upon. And while we uh, have a very broad scope for implementation reports, so um, you can submit almost anything, I also want to bring you to the attention that we just launched a call for papers that focuses really on the aspect of industry-driven innovation. So um, we, we, we want to make a theme issue that focuses on uh, public-private partnership, uh, but it can also be startups. Um, it, it's, can, it's also quite a broad spectrum, but yeah, it, uh, there should be some uh, integration of the private sector. So thank you. And I hand over to Gunther. Hi, I'm Gunther Eisenbach. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Medical Internet Research and also founder of um, a couple of other uh, digital health journals. Um, so I'm doing this work for 25 years now, believe it or not. Um, and so these reporting guidelines are actually quite old, <laughs> as I am. <laughs> so, um, but um, nevertheless, um, they, I mean, they had an impact back in the days and they continue to have an impact. And um, so I'm going to talk about two reporting guidelines. One is CHERRIES, that's for web surveys. And uh, the other one is CONSORT eHealth for randomized trials. Um, so. That's the second elephant you see here in this, <laughs> in this talk. Um, my point here is that I think in, in digital health, e-health, medical informatics, however you want to call it, um, reproducibility is often the elephant in the room um, because people report interventions, apps, um, software, uh, the effect of, of these interventions without uh, sufficient details for anybody to reproduce or falsify these results. And that's really the hallmark of science, of good science, is that somebody else can reproduce the, the results. Um, and unless somebody makes the intervention open source, that's often not the case. So at, the, at a minimum, we need a really good description of what has been done. And this is exactly what, what these guidelines, actually all of these guidelines want to address. So just to add to the slide that Tiffany um, uh, showed in the beginning, why, why we need um, guidelines. So it's not only about citations, it's also about really good science. Um, so the first guide, guideline is cherries and that is now 20 years old. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on that guideline. Um, in fact, there's only one slide on this um, because we have much more data on, on consort eHealth. Uh, I will explain in a minute why. Um, but so Cherries uh, was really the first and remains to date the, the only checklist for like how to do web surveys, electronic surveys. And back in the day in 2004, the internet was still, or the web was still like emerging and, and many, many scientific journals wouldn't even like publish uh, work when authors have used web surveys because that was always seen as like not scientific enough. Um, so I brought up these guidelines that 
uh, consists of 23 items that um, specifies things like uh, you, you should report like how the recruitment exactly was done and the, the sub-items within all these eight domains, recruitment, administration, response rate calculation. So for web service, for example, you don't have only like one response rate. You have actually what we call a view rate, a participation rate, and a completion rate of the survey. Um, and um, how do you deal with, or how do you prevent multiple entries by the same users? Uh, how, 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 uh, how were the data analyzed and so on. So that has been cited and probably used uh, at least 3,200 times. And, um, and all I can say is that it probably needs an update because it's now 20 years uh, old. So if anybody is interested in taking this on as a project, and I think I already heard some uh, feedback, um, that uh, this uh, may be an interesting project to uh, look at, look in detail on like how have people used it and these 3,200 citations, what do they actually say about this uh, guideline, if anything. Um, so the other guideline is the Consort eHealth. As you know, con as you probably know, Consort is kind of the, the mother reporting guidelines for randomized trials and there are several like extensions. One of those extensions is the consort NPT, which is the consort for non-pharmaceutical non treatments or interventions. And so we took that guideline and um, expanded it. Um, and it is a very important uh, guideline in a sense that, I mean, as you know, randomized trials are seen as kind of the top, top level in the evidence pyramid, the, the best evidence you can produce. And that's why like, we focused really on randomized trials. Um, if you were in the previous session, somebody was talking about the German DIGA, and, and, um, which makes like apps and web interventions prescribable by doctors. And to, to be pres a prescribable intervention, manufacturers have to show the evidence, and that's often done in randomized trials. At the same time, these manufacturers are also um, concerned about the, uh, pr uh, like to keep certain features perhaps proprietary and not to disclose too much. So there's this tension between manufacturers or developers having to prove effectiveness, but also at the same time, maybe you don't want to give away too many secrets uh, about how the intervention actually works. So that guideline combats this a little bit. Um, so in the, you obviously can't read this, <laughs> but I just want to point out, so the consort statement has like a single item this is item number five in the, in the generic consort statement that says describe your intervention. And there's no more information. So that expansion of the consort guideline really focuses on what should be under item five. Like what, is, what are the sub-items that you should describe about the intervention um, when you do a randomized evaluation of an e-health intervention. And um, so this was developed in a slightly more rigorous process than the CHERRY statement uh, in a sense that this was a Delphi process where then experts also ranked the importance of those items. So each item also has, is, is kind of classified in, is it like an essential item to report so that absolutely must be in the paper or is it highly recommended or is it sort of lower and uh, nice to have a lower priority item. Um, so here are some of the sub items um, that are like underneath the intervention description. So things like, of course, names, credentials, affiliations of the developers, bonus, sponsors and owners. So that is actually quite important also to distinguish whether the evaluation was done by somebody who is kind of independent from the actual developer or manufacturer. Uh, so 
ideally a bunch of researchers who are not affiliated with the manufacturer. Uh, then uh, history, development, revisions, updating, quality assurance, um, ideally publish the source co code. I, I cannot remember a single instance in the past 25 years where somebody has actually <laughs> released the source code of, of the intervention together with the publication. So digital preservation, so what happens in 10 years? Can somebody still look at that app? Um, so at a minimum, we, for example, require screenshots, so because chances are in two years or, or five years or 10 years, uh, that app is no longer uh, in, uh, existing. Um, and um, another important item is, for example, describe use parameters. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested also in, in uh, use over uh, uh, use and adherence over a longer period of time. So that ideally should also be measured. In, in pharma interventions, we have the concept of compliance or adherence. And in, in eHealth, we often have that problem of attrition that people start using an app or intervention, but then lose quickly interest. And that ideally should be measured. Um, so one innovation here is that Normally, when you submit to a journal and you fill in kind of a questionnaire for, for the, whether or not you adhered to the reporting guideline, they give you a form and you put in the page numbers of where you report this in, in your manuscript. So we didn't want this. Um, first of all, we, because uh, like we're in electronic journals, so we don't have page numbers, and the page numbers in the manuscript also change over time when the manuscript goes through revisions. So rather than, so first of all, the innovation here is that it's an electronic questionnaire, so we actually gathered the data of authors who sub submitted an RCT, and we have a very rich data set of 2,500 randomized trials in this in this field. Right, so this. This database now is, is um, actually really valuable to do a lot of like, secondary analysis on what people have done in the past, over the past 25 years. So it's electronic and it's also, um, as I said, they actually fill in the, the quote from the manuscript. So they, rather than just referencing a page number, we ask them to copy and paste the respective paragraph from their manuscript into that form. Um, so this is the form, that it's just a Google form. And um, so we have a rich data set of over 2,500 responses. We also asked some additional questions and for example, uh, questions about the app or intervention and also things like, when did you fill in this uh, questionnaire? So ideally, people would do this, um, or should do this, before they submit. That's the red one. So in this case, it's a third of a third of authors say that they consult consort when they drafted the manuscript. So that's obviously the ideal situation. Then the orange one, 13.6%. They had already submitted it, but it was in, in revision, so probably the editor or reviewers pointed out that they should adhere to those. Um, no, sorry, the, the orange is it's submitted but not reviewed yet. Uh, and the green one, 30% is submitted and after receiving the initial peer review reports. And then we also have 18.7% where authors do this after acceptance, probably because our production staff always insists on this checklist to be on, on, on record. And um, ideally, that should have been pointed out during peer review. But um, as we all know, peer review is not perfect. Um, so that checklist, as I said, uh, has like 1600, has 2,500 responses. And it was cited 1,600 times. Um, and 
the majority of authors said in the, in the question as well that the consort e has improved their paper. Uh, for a subset of these authors of the 2,500, we have around 1,975 responses to additional questions about the intervention itself. Um, I tried to tabulate some of the interventions which were uh, like evaluated more than once. You can probably not read this, but there are some actual prescribable apps on this, for example, the Praxis is a, is a prescribable, prescribable app in, in Germany. Um, people have also done studies with WeChat and text SMS uh, interventions, which are actually a class of intervention that is often very highly effective, even though it's low tech. Um, so we have 1,760 unique apps or web interventions were evaluated. Um, uh, I asked uh, the question like how often does this app or as I mentioned how often does this have to be used what's the what's the dose you can see like uh, a third has to be taken daily 20% uh, as needed 17% weekly and 17% set not applicable um, as I said, attrition is often a problem. Um, I also asked a question like, after three months, what proportion of users are still using that app or intervention? And, um, and uh, to my surprise, there are like 60% who, who don't actually know that. Um, and another surprise is that about 7% also say it's close to 100%, which is a little bit hard to believe, but uh, in a randomized trial setting, there are often other mechanisms to kind of encourage people to stick with the intervention. Um, and overall, was the app or intervention effective? So it's, it's about half-half, so, or 27% said yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's effective, all outcomes are effective, 26% said Partially, some of the outcomes were effective, and and the other ones were either like not statistically significant or inconclusive findings. Um, and so the question is, uh, one of the questions was, do you think your manuscript has improved as a result? Sixty-five percent said yes, and then a very similar question with a very similar response pattern. As a result of the checklist, did you actually make changes to the manuscript? And about uh, two thirds said uh, yes, either minor or major changes. Most actually said minor changes, that's the red here. Um, and one third said no, I didn't, I didn't make any changes. Um, we also asked like, how long does it take to actually fill that fill out that checklist. Um, so the most prevalent response here was uh, around two hours, but there were also authors who said, said like, I think the most extreme answer was two months. Um, but <laughs> what's implied in that question is also that includes like a revision to your manuscript as, as a result of going through that checklist. Um, so conclusions and future plans um, the feedback is from authors uh, always a little bit um, uh, um, ambivalent in a sense that obviously it takes time and additional effort to use a checklist and that's probably the case for all checklists or just consort eHealth. Um, so there were complaints that you know it takes a long time to go through this and there's additional work and so on. But in the interest of rigor, we are insisting of it on it. Um, then our use of Google Forms has some limitations because people couldn't like save uh, uh, in between. Uh, so and it's a very long checklist. So some people said like they lost some of the 
response as they previously entered because they couldn't save it uh, while filling it in. Uh, Google Forms has also the limitation that it's not accessible in China. So we're trying to move this to a different platform in the future. And um, I also actually think that AI can help with um, improving manuscripts or like perhaps pre-populating this kind of checklist. And we have like a pretty unique data set of with 2,500 trials with all the language in these different sub-items. So AI should be trainable to actually rec recognize certain phrases in a manuscript and pre-populate uh, a form. So that is hopefully the response to author complaints that it takes too much time and effort to do this. And so we are planning to kind of revise both of these statements in the near future. And if you want to become involved, just uh, drop us an email. We're always interested in potential collaborators, especially with AI uh, background and interest. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for your uh, panel presentations and your comments. Um, at this point in time, we have about 12 to 13 minutes remaining for questions or discussion points, if anybody has any based on some of the interesting things that you've heard today. Perhaps to start, I would be curious for those of you in the audience, now that you've heard about these uh, reporting guidances, how many of you, let's start with, how many of you have published papers? Okay, how many, keep your hands up. Those of you who have published papers, how many of you have used a reporting guideline? It doesn't have to be any of these, but a reporting guideline at any point in time. So put your hand down if you haven't. Okay, great. So hands pretty much stayed up across the board. Great. Okay, go ahead and put your hands down. For those of you who have done peer reviews, have you paid attention to whether authors use reporting guidelines? Great. All right. Very interesting. All right. Um, yeah, so does, does anyone have any questions for our panelists about uh, the, the ones that you've seen? You've seen sort of a variety of some that are newer, some are a bit older, some that can be updated, as Gunther indicated. Thanks for the great talk. I just have a question um, from an academic perspective, especially when we have all these different types of studies coming out and we not re necessarily wanting to reinvent the wheel. If guidelines are awesome and very, very important in the reporting process. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering um, from the panel, what are your views about um, studies that might be um, coming from different worldviews or different theoretical mm -hmm. and conceptual frameworks that um, might be conceptualizing that uh, the study, for example. The uh, RCTs are great because RCTs really belong in one world view, and mm -hmm. we're all looking towards um, finding the best evidence for whatever the problem is. Um, but for researchers that are looking to um, do things differently, or using a different paradigm where maybe we're not looking for uh, the best solution, uh, but may maybe uh, not, not looking for the one, the one knowledge, but which voices get heard, mm -hmm. and looking for technologies that might bring towards more equitable digital health solutions. I, I just wanted to hear from the panel panelists um, what your views on the guidelines and the theoretical, for the theoretical or conceptual frameworks that might inform some of the research. Thank you for that question. Would you like to give that a go? Um, I think from a, from a reporting guidelines perspective, they're most useful when they're focused. Um, so they're easy to find and they, they'll provide more value to the authors if they are directly relevant and aligned to what they're doing. Um, so with that in mind, it's, it becomes harder to develop reporting guidelines for uh, different worldviews or different theories that uh, are not well well defined a priori. Um, otherwise, I think they'll, they'll just be too general and it'll be uh, a checkbox exercise. 
So I think for this purpose, you really want to have very well-defined scopes and have, the, have the, uh, the checklist be very focused. That's my view. Yeah, also to add to that, um, so the place to go w where to look for reporting guidelines is the Equator Network. That's a website that uh, has like a catalog of all reporting guidelines that are out there. And I think last time I checked there were like over 250 reporting guidelines for, for like different methodologies or different like subfields. So um, it, it may be that for your specific approach or your innovative approach, there's no reporting headline out there yet. Um, but um, my point is, I think that there's already like a vast range of reporting guidelines out there that really, in my view, like covers every imaginable research approach and method. <laughs> Great. Thanks for your question. Yeah, can you come up to the microphone? Thank you very much for the wonderful um, presentation. Um, I, as a user of um, clinical guidelines, uh, uh, reporting guidelines before, as well as, mm -hmm. as a um, um, editor, I'm also, I also, I, sometimes I find that, okay, it's good to have the uh, structure uh, item to make sure that the um, uh, I will report uh, systematically. But uh, in your experience, have you also come across uh, any uh, situation that maybe a study uh, it's more than just the guideline. So is the existing guideline suitable, uh, fit enough to uh, uh, capture all the essential elements? And the second question is, uh, um, I would like to know more about how, um, what kind of AI application you are interested in terms of uh, further your uh, study. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Just to clarify for your first question, did you mean the alignment between a yes. guideline and a particular paper study? Or? Yes, uh, the alignment between the paper. So for example, some paper, um, okay, you have to uh, identify what kind of study you, uh, you, 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 are, you are reporting and then mm -hmm. find a suitable guideline. Mm -hmm. But is all the guidelines suitable, uh, like fulfill all the uh, reporting requirements? Is there any uh, additional element that has to be reported? Uh, yeah. uh, okay, great question. Yeah, would any of you like to answer that? I mean, uh, when we look at implementation reports, for example, obviously when the guideline was created, you have to make some compromises at some point because it covers a very broad spectrum. So you will have uh, implementations that don't fit 100% into that. And while in general, I think, yes, uh, we have mandatory and non-mandatory items, I think there's always a possibility to reach out to the editors and check if there's really a point that you can't respond to and you have a good explanation for it. Um, I think at least in the case of the implementation reporting, you can just um, justify it, um, why, why you can't use this. And if it seems reasonable, um, I, we won't enforce 100% uh, strict uh, adherence. Just to, to answer the, your second question about the AI, so, in my view, I mean, there are a couple of potential like, applications. First of all, as I mentioned, there are 250 reporting guidelines out there, so I think AI could perhaps help to have a look at the paper and say, okay, these are the reporting guidelines you should follow. Um, there's actually also kind of an algorithm on the Equator Network website that's kind of, is kind of perhaps the starting point of such a decision-making uh, tool. Um, second of all, AI could make sure that those items, the sub-items are properly reported and then flag it to the editor or reviewer if, if there are questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, my third point is perhaps a little bit more provocative. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about the future of publishing and it just strikes me that we continue to write for human readers and not for machines, <laughs> and especially for RCTs, um, a point could be made that perhaps 
like the, the report for the human reader should be kind of the secondary output and the, the primary output should be something that's machine readable so that we can do things like systematic reviews in an automated fashion. So a little bit provo provocative view of the future would be perhaps things like the consort eHealth form could be just the starting point for people to enter the results and, and characteristics of the intervention, et cetera, in a, in a very structured format. And then LLM could just you know, create a human readable report from that, but, but, but the, core, the core output here is kind of a semantically tacked like, paper that can also be read and digested by machines to like, quickly aggregate the evidence in certain fields. So that's kind of my, my vision for the future of publishing, actually. I, I might just add a, a little extra response also, is that in the one sli introductory slide that I had brought up, I had a little picture in the corner of some kitchen tools in the corner, um, trying to make a metaphor to that Reporting guidelines also can be useful for especially early career researchers too, as a sort of ingredient list, let's say, for uh, you know how to plan your study even before you start doing it. Which one is the right study design and how do you make sure that you're gonna be able to address all the components? That can be very useful, I think, especially for folks who you know, are getting into research or starting off um, to help guide them. Um, and then also, yeah, as Gunther indicated too, in the publishing industry, there's uh, a lot of actually vendors and even startups that are looking into using various methods to be able to analyze text and potentially evaluate for specific content um, that is there. For example, having an ethics consideration statement, data availability statement, code availability, and various other aspects that could also be relevant for certain types of studies. Mm -hmm. Claudia, did you have another question? Um, sorry, it's not so much of a question. I just ah. wanted to reply to the, the yes. question that was asked. Um, nothing's really stopping people from using multiple guidelines. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're great guidelines for you. And I've used multiple for some studies that apply to mine because one guideline just mm -hmm. wasn't enough. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that comment. We have a couple more minutes. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes, I saw your hand up. Thank you very much for the productive discussion. I was wondering, there are a lot of you know, guidelines out there specific mm -hmm. to each type of you know, study. What is your suggestions for choosing one guideline? I know some journals have their own suggestions, but not all journals have you know, suggesting uh, you know, gu specific guidelines. What do you suggest when we want to choose what guideline uh, for a specific study to follow? Yeah, great question. Well, I think you have to, um, I mean, there's, based on the type of study that will narrow the universe to a subset. So now you're choosing among guidelines in that subset. Um, I mean, I take a, see, then, then some journals re require certain guidelines, so you have to follow that, so that, that limits it even further. But if you have a choice, I mean, I, I um, would suggest being very pragmatic about this. Um, and some guidelines are, um, say, more pragmatic than others. What I find in some of the stuff that's out there is it, they're guidelines for the ideal world. Uh, so they, there's a checklist for everything that, you know, in an ideal world, you should be doing all of these things. And, uh, and then there are other guidelines where checklists where said, you know, these are, this is our world, this is reality, and just do this well you would be so far ahead if you do this well. It's what we're doing today. So I would, being pragmatic, I would focus on the latter and guidelines that are, are oriented towards the latter because that'll be more useful. You don't want to have a checklist where the large majority of the answers are, well, we didn't do this, we didn't do this because, or it's not applicable, or you know, we, the scope of our study was this, and therefore the other 50% of items are not relevant. I mean, it just takes time and then, you know, it, it, it just reflects poorly on the paper because you're trying to use something that's not uh, uh, really uh, uh, aligned with, with how studies are done today. So, so that would be an important criterion if I was doing this, I'd identify guidelines that 
uh, are pragmatic and that reflect the, the reality of research that's happening at this point in time. And then maybe in 10 years that we'll get closer to the ideal world and then you can move to other guidelines. But. Great, thank you so much. Thank you all for your attention and for your time. I hope you learned something interesting about reporting guidelines, how they came to be, why they came to be, and that they are valuable not just as an author or peer reviewer or editor, but also that they're important for supporting scientific integrity um, and contributing to our scientific knowledge in general. Um, with that, I think it's time for lunch, so I don't want to keep you any longer from that. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you also to our panelists.